Everybody, you are about to watch the Palai Bible Church program, the moment of transformation. Today, by the grace of the Lord, we shall listen to our pastor, General Superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoyi. We are going to be blessed. It is my wish that you call your family to come and listen to you, as our pastor is blessing you with his holiness blessing. In Proverbs chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 20. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words, incline the ear unto my sayings. Let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. The word is life to those who find the word and it sells to all their flesh. I want to talk to you this morning on healing and health for the whole man. Healing and health for the whole man. We need to explain something about healing. Everybody knows what healing is, but there, is, uh, there are different approaches to healing. For example, you're on the crusade field. The healing sometimes looks sensational. Sometimes it looks spectacular. But what you want to think about is what is scriptural, sensational. When something happens out of the ordinary, and it appears it's not the regular thing, the ordinary thing, the day-to-day -day thing, that's sensational. Or sometimes is a kind of mountain that had been there for a long time. But understand, many people do not have such mountains. They're sick, they're infirm, they have diseases. But it's not the spectacular type. When you have a congregation of about 1,000, not up to 100 will be blind. Not up to 100 will be lame and not up to 100 will have cancer. But many people, they stop at the sensational, they stop at the spectacular. They do not understand, we need to go beyond that and have the scriptural. The scriptural is that they were all healed. Whether it's a minor problem, a major problem, a long-standing problem, or whatever kind of problem, if it is scriptural, it must be that everyone there will have chance to claim their healing. And I pray that healing will be yours in Jesus' name. So healing on the one hand, health on the other hand, and that goes beyond healing. We're talking of something perfect. That is when we say health, you're totally healthy within and without, spirit, soul, and body. If you look at Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, reading from verse 16, it says in verse 16, and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. When you have that perfect soundness, internally you are made whole. Externally, you are made whole. Every part of your body receives the healing touch of the Lord. You have something, number one, perfect. Number two, it's perpetual. Not that you are healed now, one week again. After that, you are skin for healing again. Or maybe a month or one year after that, you want to get healed again because you are getting healed and getting sick and getting healed and getting sick. But something perpetual. And we're talking of something permanent. When the healing is perfect, when it is perpetual, and when it is permanent, we we'll say that is health. You're healthy. Healing and health for the whole man. Many people have an idea that it's only prayer that gets them well, makes them whole, and keeps them well. Actually, when you look at the scriptures, a lot of things contributed to our healing and our health. Number one, our habits. 
our habits. That's why the Lord gave the children of Israel the word. And he gave them the word to regulate their day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day lifestyle. And he said, if you will keep to these things, I'm making covenant with you. I'll keep you healthy. Your habits contribute to your health or healing. Number two is holiness. It's a, when, when you come to the Lord and you see people that pray, look at Ezekiah. Isaiah said, set your house in order because you will die, you will not live. And then he turned to them and said, oh Lord, remember, I've worked with a perfect heart before you. On the basis of that holiness, the Lord said, I'm going to add 15 years unto you. Number three is the hope that we have. You see, when you are hopeless, it generates a sickness in your body, in your mind. A mind that is depressed, a mind that is unhappy, a mind that has no hope at all, you'll not be healthy. But when your hope is lively, let's read that in uh, Proverbs chapter 13, reading here from verse 12. Proverbs chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 12. You'll see how hope contributes to being healthy. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. When you are hopeless, it makes you sick. But it says, uh, that verse, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. So what contributes to our healing? What contributes to our health? Number one, our habits. Number two, our holiness. Holiness in the Lord through the power of the Lord. Number three, our home. Number four, our home. Our home. If fire is burning at home, you are likely to have hypertension. If there is no rest at home, no peace at home, if the troubles are coming from here and there, in-laws on their part, husband on his part, and wife on, his, on her own part, and the children, and nobody is at peace, you are not going to stay healthy because of that condition in the home. The condition of the home also contributes, not only that when sin is in one member of the family, like uh, you remember the case of uh, uh, this man, uh, look at uh, Genesis chapter 20. In Genesis chapter 20, this man had taken another man's wife. And you might think, well, that's not just his problem. No, it was a problem for the whole home. And as the home was not right with God, they couldn't stay healthy. We're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence uh, toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shom, and sojourned in Gerah. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, uh, Gera, sent and took Sarah. You know that as a result of that, sickness came on the whole family. Look at verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his uh, maidservants, and they bear children. For the Lord at first closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So then, what contributes our healing? What contributes our health? I mean, stable health, solid health, continual health, perpetual health, your habits, the holiness, the hope, the hope, hygiene, number five. You see, hygiene plays a great part in, uh, in our health. You have heard of uh, this, uh, this epidemic of Ebola that just uh, came to the people recognize, that just recognized in Africa, actually. Uh, it was first discovered in uh, 1976. It's been on for a long time. But people are just waking up to it now. And if you are not hygienic, for example, if you don't wash your hands uh, when you go to a toilet and come back, and if you stay with somebody that has uh, that disease, it's contagious. And if uh, there's a passing of fluid from one to the other. But if you keep yourself hygienic, it helps you in preventing sicknesses coming upon you. I pray you'll be healthy in Jesus' name. That's why you'll find in the Old Testament and, and New Testament, touch not the unclean thing, touch not the unclean thing, touch not the unclean thing. And there are many of the laws of the children of Israel that actually was to preserve them in cleanliness and hygiene. So hygiene 
contributes to our, uh, our, our health and our healing. Uh, number six is your happiness. Happiness. When you are happy, when uh, there is no sorrow within, you are hilarious. Sometimes you even laugh uh, because uh, your laughter contributes and joy contributes. It says the joy of the Lord is your strength. But we are told directly in uh, Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 22. Proverbs 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart, a joyful heart, a happy heart, and that does good like medicine. Your happiness contributes also. Also, uh, hospitality contributes. Do you remember when uh, Dorcas died? And uh, Peter was nearby. Then they called for Peter. And all they could show about Dorcas was the hospitality. Look at what she did for us when she was alive. What she did for us when she was alive. And because of that, everybody, they wished the best for her. And they were, if they could raise her, they would have done that. And when she was alive, if they could keep her healthy and happy and strong, they would have done that. Hospitality. What you give to other people will come back to you. If you uh, sow joy in other people's lives and you show goodness in other people's lives, it will come back to you too. And that's why it's very important that you keep all those things in mind. Well, if you are sick, the Lord will heal you. And then after you are healed, you need to know that all these things contribute to making you stay healthy. That's why we're talking about healing and health for the whole man. Three things we're going to consider. Number one, Habitual heralds of sickness and disease. Habitual heralds, that is, uh, the things that come before a uh, sickness, that come before disease, and they're habitual. It's, it's part of the habit that when this is there, sickness will soon come. If these things are there, sickness will soon follow. And so, if you do not want these sicknesses and diseases to be upon your life, what you are going to do is, you say, I know that there's an herald of sickness, a forerunner of sickness. The one that always comes before sickness, you get rid of that herald, get rid of that forerunner, and then sickness will not be there in the name of Jesus. Number two, healing for the sick and the depressed by prayer, by the word of God. And by the authority of the name of Jesus that break every yoke, healing for the sick and the depressed. Number three, health and wholeness for saints and uh, disciples. Health and wholeness for saints and disciples. We're looking at number one, the heralds of sickness and disease. In Psalm 107, Psalm 1. 107 verses 17 and 18. You see the reason why the children of Israel became sick when they shouldn't have been sick. They had the power of God with them, they had the protection of the Lord with them, the promise of God with them. They shouldn't have been sick at all, but yet they became sick. Why? Psalm 107 verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression. And because of their iniquities are afflicted. And so the sickness is not uh, the will of God. The sickness is not that this is what God has ordained. But because of the law of sowing and reaping. And it says fools. Because of their transgression. Fools. Because of their iniquity. They are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. And the draw near unto the gates of death. They became so sick, they were about dying. Why? Because God wanted them sick? No. Because they're of their foolishness, because of their iniquity, because of their evil. In Hosea chapter 8, Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, it says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. They sowed the wind. That is, they sowed the wild oath. And because of that, they're reaping sicknesses and infirmities in their lives. Sometimes it's because we don't take care of ourselves. We don't uh, feed normally. We don't uh, live normally the way we ought to live. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. Acts, chapter 27. 
reading from verse 21. If we are going to stay healthy, and if uh, the members of the family are going to stay healthy, we need to watch what we eat and how we eat and, and when we eat. Acts 27 verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. They had some harm, they had some loss because they didn't listen. They were not watching their lives. They were not living the way they ought to live. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the sheep. And then he goes on to tell them, uh, look at verse 33. While the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take me, saying, This day is the fourteenth day. Ye have tarried and have continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your what? For your health. So if you are not uh, feeling well and you are not eating normally, properly, you might make yourself sick. But apart from those uh, physical uh, things, sometimes it's uh, the way we uh, live our lives in uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 13, reading from verse 3. It says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have what? Destruction. Sometimes is the use of the mouth, the use of your tongue. Miriam would never have known what is called leprosy were it not for the use of her own tongue. And um, Zechariah, the father of uh, John the Baptist, would not have known darkness for nine months but for the use of her mouth. And uh, the wife of uh, David would not have known barrenness, but for the way she used her mouth. Watch your tongue. Keep that tongue. Because out of it may be either life or death. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Uh, by your tongue, you could make yourself uh, sick. And by your tongue, you, should, you can proclaim yourself well and keep yourself well. Let, let's look at uh, the, the example of the children of Israel. Numbers chapter 21. In Numbers chapter 21, reading from verse 5, it tells us about the children of Israel. and tells us about the destruction that came on them. Why? Because of the negative and the wrong use of their tongue. It says in uh, Numbers chapter 21, verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, in this uh, wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathed this light bread. And you can see in that same verse, you can see double talk there. The apostle Paul said, there is no bread. Later they said, okay, this light bread. Actually, they got the bread of heaven and God favored them in a special way. But because of the wrong attitude they had, they said there's no bread. Okay, we, we know that the light bread is there, but what is that one? Look at verse 6. And the Lord sent furry serpents among the people, and they beat the people, and much people of Israel died. Many of them died. Okay, you say that's the Old Testament. New Testament, nothing like that. It's the age of grace, the time of grace. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you see that in the New Testament, too, there are things that uh, make people to get sick, and uh, they, they, some of them even died uh, prematurely. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, 
And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not making any difference between the Lord's body and a club in the world, the Lord's body and a society in the world. He doesn't have any respect for the body of Christ, doesn't have any respect for the people of God, talks anyhow, says anything, acts anyhow. In the case of the children of, the, of the, the Corinthians, we know that they were taking each other to court. They didn't understand that the body of Christ was special. They were broadcasting and proclaiming and all the things they saw in the body of Christ in the church, they were telling the world. And it says they did not discern the body of Christ, that this is the temple of God, this is the body of Christ, and they need to show some honor and some respect. And love the people of God. It says in verse 30, for this cause, some, I said some, many, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means many of them died. I pray that God will help us that uh, these things will not be in our midst in Jesus' name. John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we read about a man. A man that experienced the healing touch of the Lord. John chapter 5, verse 5. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. But Jesus healed him. The Lord will heal you. In verse 8, Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Verse 9. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. That was great healing, spectacular healing. But look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus find, findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. See no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The Lord was saying, you've been sick for 38 years. That was terrible. But now you're healed. Now you're set free and made whole. But see no more. If you do, a worse thing can come unto you. So those were the heralds bringing sickness and disease in the lives of people. Get saved. When you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ. All things will pass away. All things will become new. And then your health will be guaranteed in Jesus' name. Now, if we're sick, we can call upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord will heal us. I thought you will say, Amen. Amen. In, Pro in Psalm 107, verses 19 and 20. Psalm 107, verses 19 and 20. Remember, we had read verses 17 and 18. They were sick because of, our, of their, their transgression. They were afflicted because of their iniquity. But they didn't just say, okay, it's my fault, it's my sin. And since it was my sin, what can I do? You can pray. You, you can do something. You can call upon the name of the Lord. In the Psalm 107, verse 19, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he, save, he saveth them out of their distress. He will do it again. Amen. He sent his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. He delivered them. He has not changed. He will deliver you. Amen. In Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. When we pray, God answers. If we have sinned and our sin caused our sickness, we call upon the Lord and repent of our sin. And then restoration and healing and health will come in Jesus' name. So, uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, reading from verse 15. Thus says the Lord in chapter, chapter 30, verse 15. Verse 15, why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquities. You see that? He said, your sorrow is much. And the sickness even appears incurable. 
Why? Because of the multitude of your iniquity. Because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. But that's not the end. Verse 17. I will restore health unto thee. I will heal thee of thy wounds, says the Lord, because they call thee an outcast, saying, There is a Zion, whom the no man seeketh after. The Lord said, Yes, the sickness is there, the infirmity is there. You brought it upon yourself, but that's not the edge. The Lord has promised He will heal us. He will heal us in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter chapter 17, verse 14. That's how we pray. That's how we call upon the Lord. That this is what you said you will do. Oh Lord, do it. He forgives sin. He saves the soul. He also heals the sickness. 17, verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. This morning, there's no, uh, uh, there is no uh, white gap between your prayer and the answer to your prayer. You see, it says, heal me, and immediately it says, I shall be healed. Then it says, save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. It will happen in Jesus' name. Even if that sickness appears coming from the enemy, coming from the destroyer, this time it will set you free in Jesus' name. In chapter 15, verse 21, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 21, and I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Amen. That's what he said he will do. And this is the day when he will do it. Amen. He will set you free, set us free completely in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, in uh, chapter 31, Jeremiah 31, verse 11. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. That strong one, the Lord will break that yoke. That oppression, the Lord will take it away. Anything too hard for God? Anything too hard for the Lord? In Jeremiah chapter 32, reading from verse 17, Our Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth, by, the, by thy great power and stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. This morning, nothing too hard for him. In your life, nothing too hard for him. The challenge you face, nothing too hard for him. Isaiah chapter 53, it tells us about the sacrifice of Jesus even before Jesus came. Looking forward to the time Christ will come, he spoke about Calvary, spoke about the cross, spoke about what Jesus will do. He did it for you, and the sacrifice of Christ will be effective in your life. Isaiah chapter 53, reading from verse 4. Surely, any doubt? Surely, any doubt? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. If there's any sin in your life, the Lord will forgive you. If you have not been born again, you've never known the Lord. This morning, you'll be born again in Jesus' name. Because Jesus took your sins away already. He bore your sin. He bore your penalty. He bore the punishment of your sin upon him. That's why he said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. There will be peace in your family. Peace in your soul. And peace in your life in Jesus' name. And with his stripes we are healed. The stripes of Christ that he bore procures our healing with the stripes we are healed. Referring to that which Isaiah had prophesied, let's see the fulfillment in Matthew chapter 8. The fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. We're looking at Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. 
any evil spirit tormenting any life here this morning, the authority of the name of Jesus will cast that thing out. Yeah. You will be free. Yeah. Then he goes on to say, he healed, verse 16, he healed, how many of them? I said how many of them? He healed all that was sick. That's what I told you about, uh, you know, the healing that Jesus performed. On the crusade field, when you have uh, many people there, if one person raises up crutches, then it becomes sensational. Everybody is running up and down and shouting. And the rest of the people, they might go back home, not remembering that they themselves, they need healing. In the service this morning, it's not sensational, it's going to be scriptural. Yeah. Because it says, he healed all that were sick. If you're sick, you'll not carry your sickness back home. Yeah. Jesus did not pay for the healing of only the blind, only the lame, only the people that have great big mountains. For everyone, every kind of infirmity, every kind of sickness, everything must go. Then it says in verse 17 that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. He has carried your sickness away, you will not carry it anymore. That fulfillment will find in First Peter, First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 24. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 assures us that by stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2, 24. Who is his own self bear our sins. It is somebody on the tree. That's what gives us salvation. We know that all our sins, without exception, it doesn't forgive the big ones and leave the little ones. He does not forgive many and leave a few. He takes everything away. If you understand that all your sins have been laid on Christ, and then it says, His own self bear our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. Now it talks about our salvation. It talks about all the sins being taken away. It does the same thing with sickness. If you have uh, three sicknesses, it's not going to take two and leave one there. If you have five sicknesses, it's not going to take three and leave two there. It's going to take everything away. It takes all the sins away. It takes all the sicknesses away. If you have any attack, any affliction, um, an evil spirit is tormenting you here, tormenting you over there, it's not going to silence uh, five uh, evil spirits and then say, okay, manage the rest. Uh, the one there, you can endure that one. No, no. It's going to take everything away. And then it says, by whose stripes ye were healed. That healing has come. And uh, that's why the psalmist gave glory to God and praised the name of the Lord in uh, Psalm 103, Psalm 103. I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 103. And we're reading from verse 1. 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You'll bless the Lord. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Some people only have the benefit of salvation. Benefit of healing, they don't have. Benefit of deliverance, they don't have. Benefit of uh, marriage, they don't have. Benefit of miracle children, they don't have. But it says all his benefits. The Lord is going to answer all the requests of your heart. All the benefits of Calvary for salvation, that's there. Sanctification, that's there. The power of the Holy Ghost, that's there. Healing, that is there. Deliverance, that's there. Beyond deliverance, we are going to have dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who healeth, who forgiveth, how many iniquities? Tell me out loud. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. We should not be carrying guilt about. I'm saved, I'm born again, but there's something terrible that I did is still haunting me. No sin will haunt you. No infirmity will haunt you. 
Because when forgiveness comes, it forgives everything. If God has forgiven you, you must forgive yourself too. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and who healeth how many diseases? All thine diseases. Your eyes will receive the touch of the Lord. Your ears will receive the touch of the Lord. Every part of you will experience that healing in Jesus' name. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Nobody will destroy your life. The protection of the Lord will be upon your life in Jesus' name. Then it says, Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Verse 5, Who satisfies thy mouth with Satisfy the mouth with good things, it will prosper you. Amen. What to eat will not be denied you. Amen. It satisfies your mouth with good things, you are going to have testimony. Amen. So that the youth is renewed like the eagles. It will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. And then it tells us in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Reading from verse 13. James chapter 5. We're reading from verse 13. All these references show us that the promises of God are yes and amen. And these promises will never fail. And even if uh, your sickness or your infirmity had been foolishly caused by your own transgression, he'll forgive the transgression. And then he'll set you free from every infirmity and sickness. It says in James chapter 5, verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Why will he pray? Because God will answer your prayer. Is any merry? Let him see. Why is he singing psalms? Because he's giving glory and praise to God. You pray, after that you'll sing. I said you pray, after that you are going to see. Do you know there are people, they pray and pray and pray, they never see. They pray, they don't expect the answer to their prayers. After the prayer, you begin to see. Don't you see Jehoshaphat when he was going to the battlefield? Yes, he prayed. And after the prayer, even before the victory came, he knew victory has come. Do you know victory has come? And do you know that he has answered your prayer? And then before you see anything at all, you shout your Jericho walls down. They will come down in Jesus' name. It says, let him pray. And then later, it, after that, it says, let him sing. Son, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then the prayer of faith may save the sick. If it's a good time, if you know we have a good emotion, then perhaps he may get well. What does it say? It shall save the sick. It shall save the sick. This morning, it shall save the sick. You know, over here, it doesn't say if there is no curse, then God will answer prayer. Curse, sickness, everything bundled together, they'll go in Jesus' name. You know, when you come to the New Testament, the New Testament does not make allowance for a territorial cause or yoke or whatever. It's because of background. It's because of uh, forefathers, because of anything. All those things, they are bundled together. Calvary takes everything away. That's why it says over here, the prayer of faith shall save the sea and the Lord shall raise him up. I'm talking about somebody over there. The Lord shall raise him up. And it says, if, if he has committed sin, if he has committed sin, then he say pity, his sickness will remain because he has committed sin. What does it say? Tell me out loud. They shall be forgiven him. You are forgiven in Jesus' name. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayer we pray this morning concerning you will avail much in Jesus' name. You see, every time God raises up uh, a people, 
he raises up a righteous man to lead them and to go with them. That's why every time Moses prayed for the children of Israel, God always answered. Even when the whole of the children of Israel, when they had gone to worship idol, and God said, Moses, leave me alone. I'm going to destroy all of them. But the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth most. And therefore Moses said, Lord, you cannot do it. You will not destroy them. And when we stand here and pray for you that God will not destroy you, he will not destroy you. That your sicknesses will not remain, it will not remain in Jesus' name. You know, when God raised up uh, Elijah for the children of Israel, they had gone to worship Baal and eventually they were spamming for three and a half years. And Elijah came and said, why are you halting between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If he's there, then go and worship him. They could not speak a single word. They, they, their guilt silenced them. And then he said, you know the story. And eventually he prayed. The dream come. I said, when Elijah prayed, the dream come. The effectual of having prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He raised up Elijah for them. Every time Elijah prayed for them, God always answered. We are going to pray for you this morning. And you are weak, you are sick, you are doubting. You say, I don't know, I fasted, I prayed, I don't know what is happening to me. Don't worry about that. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You will go home with joy. You go home with your healing. Because this is why we're here. This is why you are in the church. That if you cannot handle the problem yourself, then the leadership in the church will handle it for you. That's why it says in verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And he prayed again. We prayed before, we're going to pray again. And if maybe you said, well, you prayed for me before, but uh, look at this, look at it, don't look at anything, we will we'll pray again. And this time, that infirmity will have to go in Jesus' name. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, heaven will open for you. And the earth brought forth her fruit. Your house will bring forth fruit. The work of your hand will be fruitful. Yeah. Number one, habitual errors of sickness and disease. Number two, healing for the sick and the depressed. Depression is going from your life. Yeah. Destruction will leave your life. Yeah. Number three now, health and wholeness for saints and disciples. Health and wholeness for uh, saints and disciples. Now, we're going beyond healing. We're going beyond, I was sick, I came, and I was sick. Praise God for that. What we're talking about now is that you'll be perpetually healthy. You'll be permanently healthy. That you will say, by the grace of God, I am made whole and I am healthy in Jesus' name. Now, as you read your Bible... You must uh, read what is written, and sometimes you think about what is not even mentioned there. What do I mean by that? You look at Matthew chapter 4, Jesus healed them. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus healed them. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus healed them. Matthew chapter 10, he gave the power, the authority to the disciples to go and heal the sick. You will not find once that Peter, James, John, Matthew, they also lined up and they said, ah, Jesus, you are healing uh, the Phoenician woman's daughter. You are healing the woman with issue of blood. I'm here too. I'm having my own problem too. They were healthy. The disciples were healthy. I said they were healthy. Healing is for the sick in the world. Health is for the people of God in the church. And if you understand that and you claim that, you will be healthy. Satan will not knock your head. Nothing will walk around in your body. You are a saint of God. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You must be healthy. And from this day I declare you are healthy in Jesus' name. 
<laughs> we need to understand that uh, the, sometimes they say, I'm a convert, I'm a convert. You go from being a convert to being a disciple. Others will say, I'm a member of the church, I'm a member. That's wonderful. You go from being a member to being a saint. Let me show you. Those, uh, those titles for you is for you. I said it's for you. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Called to be saints. We're referred to as saints. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Don't you ever forget you are a saint. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Churches of the saints. He has called you to be saved. That's why sickness will run away from you. That's why Satan will run away from you. A saint is untouchable. You're untouchable in Jesus' name. You are not like all the, you know, the other people who are just say they go to church, go to church, they fall, they rise, they are here, they are, they are not there sometimes. But you are called to be a saint. And if you remain a saint by the grace of God, a disciple by the grace of God, apart from healing, health, you will enjoy health. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm reading from verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. Just telling you in different books of the New Testament that you are called to be a saint, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. You see, every time, as Paul was writing, it's not just, okay, we are converts, we are just uh, Christians, uh, we are churchgoers, and although we are not uh, good enough, no, we're saints. And inside you, the grace of God will make you a saint. In your language, you'll make you a saint. In your outlook, you'll be a saint. And when you are walking like this, when a saint of God is walking in, Satan will clear out of the way. All those demons, they'll clear out of the way in Jesus' name. And look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as their children and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelly savor and fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming who? Saints. That, that's, that's it. Romans were saints. First Corinthians were saints. Second Corinthians were saints. Ephesians here were saints. I could go on and on, but let me just read uh, one or two more. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Sickness is not the inheritance of the saints. Demonic oppression is not the inheritance of the saints. Sorrow and heartache, hypertension, cancer, that's not the inheritance of the saints, but hell's and joy, happiness, and goodness, and the goodness of the Lord following you all the days of your life, that is the inheritance of the saints. Holiness and then heaven, that you get to heaven at last, because I, I believe you are going to heaven. I said that's why you came, I believe you are going to heaven. Or you only want to be a church member here in the world, but heaven, how many are going to heaven? It will be your inheritance in Jesus' name. That, that, that's what we want, that everything here on earth, you are blessed. And there in heaven, you are rewarded in Jesus' name. The inheritance of the saints. And do you remember, you know, what we, uh, what we stand for in this church? Every time we say that, it's even written at the back there. But look at it, Jude, verse 3. Jude, chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, you will see that uh, what we're talking about is the saintliness of the, all the members of, of the world, of the church of God. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence right unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered, which was once delivered unto, unto the saints. Are you one of them? Amen in your life in Jesus' name. 
health and wholeness for the saints and the disciples. You see, many people, they don't think of the word disciple anymore. They just say, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I'm a church goer. I belong to deeper life. I belong to this. I belong to that. Disciples. That's what Jesus mentioned. And if you're a disciple, disease will run away from you. Satan will run away from you because you are following Jesus close step by step. Here is Jesus, here is disciple, here is a master, here is a follower, and nothing will come in between you in Jesus' name. In fact, what do disciples have? What has been given to the disciples? I'm looking at it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. You are a disciple. Here is your heritage. Here is your possession. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. Matthew chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 1. Matthew chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 1. And he called, and when he had called his, uh, unto him his 12 disciples, that's it, disciples, he gave them weakness. He gave them timidity. He gave them fear. Fear of demons, fear of death, fear of devil, fear of this, fear of that. It's gone in Jesus' name. He gave them power against unclean spirits. Unclean spirits will not have a place in your life. To cast them out and to all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, you will heal. Not only that you are healed, you will be an agent, a carrier of the healing power of Jesus in Jesus' name. In uh, Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power. Disciples, if you're a disciple, that's what you carry. That's what you have. You know, somebody says, you know, I'm a believer. I'm a member of the church. I'm always weak. I don't know what's happening to me. My heart is not pumping well. I'm not breathing well. You will breathe well today. Because you are a disciple. He gives you power. You are a disciple. He gives you authority. And all those things that you have been afraid of, you turn back and say, hey, I discovered something today. I'm a saint. I said, you discovered something today. You are a saint. And then you sometimes, you know, a dog is running, a dog is barking, and then you are running. And uh, then you see that if you keep on running, this dog is also running up. All of a sudden, you stop and you turn around to say, Hey, get out of there. And that, that uh, dog will be surprised. He didn't know you have that power in you. Demons are surprised. They don't know you have that power in you. You have something? I said, You have something? You'll be running, running, running away from then. You realize I'm a disciple, I'm a follower of Jesus. I must represent Christ and do what Christ has done. Then you stop and you turn, you say, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out. They come out in Jesus' name. That's why it says, Behold, I give unto you power. Thank God I have power. I said, Thank God I have power. To tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. How many? How much of their power? All the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I know you read that before. Let me interpret it to you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Cancer will not hurt you. Ulcer will not hurt you. Ebola will not hurt you. And HIV AIDS will not hurt you. You are a disciple. He will keep you healthy. He will keep you strong. Nothing will turn your brain. Your brain will be normal. Your brain will be correct. It is the heritage of the children of God. And thank God this morning you have it in Jesus' name. I'm reading to you now from Second Kings chapter Second Kings chapter twenty, chapter twenty in verse one. And in those days, Ezekiah was sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of uh, the son of Amos, came to him and said, "Thus says the Lord: Search thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live." You see, there are some people that uh, they have been coming to the church, uh, Deeper Life. They say, that's my church, Deeper Life. I, this is my church. Are you there? Yeah. Which one is your church? 
Okay. But, you know, we come on Sunday, deep alive, deep alive. On Monday, deep alive, deep alive. On Tuesday, you sneak out somewhere. And where you sneak out to, you know, uh -huh, you can recognize. Deep alive. They came over here today, but they never go any other place. But today, they come. Then they pray to you. They say, ah, deep alive. You come here today. We should tell you something. You deep alive people, you don't believe vision, you don't believe revelation, but God said you are going to die. That if you don't leave that place and come here and we do ceremony for you and do something for you and fast and pray and you know and give you oil that you take it home and then if you say you are deep alive, you don't believe this one, well, you will die. And then you say, I don't want to die. Okay, if you don't want to die, leave that place and come here. Me, I will not live deeper. When somebody lives deeper, he goes to shallow. If you are shallow, it will not take Satan too much trouble. It stretches you out like this, you are gone. But me, see, everywhere I go, they know I am deeper. Praise the Lord. And that devil, can he doesn't know where I am. He doesn't know where to find me. He doesn't know whether I'm here or I'm here, I'm here. Before he gets over there, I'm gone. And if you are deeper, something is happening to you. They will not catch you. I said they will not catch you. And so Isaiah said, Ezekiah, this is not my fault. Oh. God sent me to you. Set your house in order, you will die. Ezekiah said, I don't accept that. What do you say? Whatever their prophecy, I don't accept that. Are you going to die? Have you done enough in this world? You are going to die? Look at verse, look at verse 2. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to God, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, what am I hearing? Am I hearing well? Death, it's not time yet. I said it's not time yet. Remember now how I have walked before the truth. This man is deeper. With a perfect heart. That's how you know deeper. Do you see deeper life there? Of course. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiah wept so. And it came to pass, for Isaiah was gone out of the midst of the court, that the word of the Lord came to him. The word will come to you again. We read the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, the general superintendent of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you will accept the old word, and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week and the one we are going to listen to the next week. By the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, if we tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.